Hey everybody, welcome back to Pop Culture Warrior. I'm your host, CQ, and joining me today is the brilliant mind behind some of the most compelling narratives seen on screen. He's a master storyteller who has captivated audiences with his work on the critically acclaimed miniseries Band of Brothers and the enigmatic historical drama Anonymous. His passion for history and knack for bringing intricate tales to life have set him miles apart in the entertainment industry. And now he's taking us back to the skies of World War II with the breathtaking new Apple TV series, Masters of the Air. Please welcome to the show the creator, writer, co-executive producer of the series, the remarkable John Orloff, everybody. Yay! Hey there. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh my God, I'm I'm so excited uh, to talk with you. Um, first and foremost, I'm always curious to our guest. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're military themed pop culture, so uh, obviously you have such a passion for this this uh, military writing. What what's your military connection? Was it, was there family, friends, anything like that? No, no. My my dad served in the the Korean conflict as a disc jockey in in Tokyo. Um, and other than that, no, it was growing up, uh, in the seventies, uh, watching a lot of television that reran World War II movies, you know, mm. uh, and Hogan's Heroes and Mikhail's Navy and, uh, all these, the guns of Navarone. And, and so I sort of grew up with, with just World War II entertainment and then would read books and became obsessed. So that that's where my interest comes really as a fan and an armchair historian. Outstanding. Outstanding. There, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Um, so obviously as, as a follow up to Band of Brothers, I mean, Masters of the Air has been a massive hit. Uh, how does it feel to have created Apple TV's most watched series launch ever? Well, I didn't create it. Let me, let me, uh, it was Tom and Steven and uh, I just wrote it. Um, t Tom, it feels amazing. Um, I, I'm still kind of pinching myself. You know, Band of Brothers wasn't a hit uh, when we made it uh, because it, it came out two days before 9-11. Mm. So the first two episodes aired the Sunday night before the Tuesday that the Twin Towers fell. And after the towers fell, nobody wanted to watch Band of Brothers. You didn't want to watch people losing their legs. Um, so we went off a little bit. It wasn't a hit. So uh, this is sort of my first hit and I'm, it's, it's kind of fun. I'm, I'm really uh, enjoying it. I'm really just glad people are watching it. You know, that's why we made it for people to watch it. Of course, of course. And I mean, say what you will about Band of Brothers, but obviously, it didn't connect right away given the circumstances, but it did go on to become, I think, one of the absolutely best selling no. DVD TV yeah. series of all time. So you know, that was its sort of its sort of saving grace was well, because people hadn't watched it really on HBO the first time it aired. When it came out on DVD, everybody bought it on DVD. So it was right. a huge DVD fit. Uh, absolutely. Fit. Yeah. How how did um your passion for World War II history influenced the approach to writing this series. And I'm curious, why specifically the stories of the 100th Bomb Group? Well, there we come back to the created by. that That's Tom and Steven. You know, one of the things that they are so great at is choosing the right story to tell. Um, and if you choose the right story, then you don't have to make up a lot of shit, you know? Yeah, you have to make up a little bit of stuff or you have to combine things or, you know, but as little as possible, you know. And so uh, they they had read Masters of the Air before I did and they sent it to me with the idea, hey, we really think there might be a show here based on Buck, Bucky and Rosie, not Crosby. That was one of my ideas. Um, but yeah, so so they came to me and and once you read their story, it is kind of a no brainer. You almost can't believe what you're reading actually happened. In fact, I think it's kind of funny with the show. I've read online some of the, the reactions and people just don't understand it's true. They really just can't believe it. You know, they can't, for example, you know, they, they don't believe that planes fly that fast when they're in closing speeds. They don't believe that there was only one plane left. They don't mm. believe that Buck and Bucky 
we're really that Hollywood. They think we're being Hollywood. No, 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 no. These are the original yeah. hotshot pilots that walked and talked like that. Mm. That's who, Maverick, Top Gun. That, that, that all comes from these guys. Right. These are the first who walked around like that. You know, and you'll notice the replacement pilots as the show goes on aren't like that. Rosie is not like that. He's a different dude coming from a different generation, you know. Mm. Um, so, yeah, they picked the right story. And then I just had to figure out or they picked the right guys. And I had to figure out how to make it into a, a nine yeah. hour story. That's incredible. The thing I hear a lot, too, is like, oh, there, there's no way, you know, they could take that much damage and still, you know, fly and land. I'm like, man, they could. If it's got wings. Yeah, you have no idea what this plane could take. Way more than the B-24, supposedly. The B-24 could get shot down a lot easier. For whatever reasons, the B-19, I mean, the, sorry, the B-17 was just a fucking beast. Love and it. I mean, uh, we I had arguments, some pretty serious arguments with some of our technical advisors who didn't believe that a plane would do what it historically did. Right. And I would have to like literally get like my homework and say, no, 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 it really happened. Look, this this is exactly what happened. Yeah. And um, it is kind of unbelievable. Yeah, one of, one of my favorite stories coming out of that era too was uh, when they were mapping out as planes would come back and they would map out you know, where the hits were taken and they're like, okay, these are the places right. we have to right. reinforce. And you're like, you're not looking at the problem. <laughs> if they came right. back with those holes, they're fine. Right, right, reinforce right. Yeah. everything else. But um, they were desperate. They were desperate to 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 try to figure out what was going wrong. Yeah. You know, because it was going wrong mm -hmm. for a long time. You know, uh, these 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 losses were just astronomical. You know, yeah. the first now now that episode five is done. You know. You have to understand, thirty-four out of the thirty-six original planes that arrived in June of forty-three. Three months later, they're gone. 34 out of 36, gone, you know? Um, so the, the brass was desperately trying to figure out how do we <laughs> get the odds slightly better? Uh, and they would do anything. That's why there's those interrogation after reports. They went through everything with fine toothpicks. And that then serviced me because all of that was written down. So I have all the after mission reports from the missions so you know in in episode whatever when we show a, or when rosie's plane gets hit by a rocket in episode five on its port wing port no starboard wing that's because that's what really happened right. you know uh same uh, i think i think maybe one of the things in in episode three we, we uh we used a rocket instead of cannon fire but mm -hmm. but all of all of clevin's hits on his ship really happened you know and where they happened and we know that because we have the after mission reports so we we all used it special effects guys the directors the actors we all used the truth oh, that's, that's incredible what were what were like the most challenging aspects of bringing this whole thing to life everything um i don't think people yet understand the scale of the show um it's about to get a lot bigger um and it's already been pretty big um and so everything was really challenging you know because the scale of the air war you know we, we set out from the beginning of saying this is about scale the air war is about scale one of the unpointed out things you'll see in the show is every mission there's more planes in the air every single one first mission there's only like 20 planes in the air second mission you see there's maybe 70 planes in the air third mission there's a couple hundred that get into the air by the end of the show there's going to be a thousand fighters i mean sorry a thousand bombers and 500 p-51s you know um so the sh the show has always been about scale and 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 doing anything on such a scale is really hard as as, as for filmmaking you know it's just sure. everything is hard you know every single episode has 400 special effects shots 400 
so so to put that in perspective like uh star trek like the the original star trek not the original original but like the star trek the next generation they would do 60 effect shots in an episode right. you know now obviously by the time of game of thrones you're getting to hundreds as well right. but the other thing that's really kind of interesting about this is these have to look real it's like one thing to do game of thrones and nobody's going to argue about how many fucking talons a dragon has yeah. right Nobody's going to second guess you and go, oh, you know what? That dragon, that is not what a dragon from fucking yeah. Kandahor looks like in 1942, you know? Right. So, you know, while I'm sure you, we don't get 100% everything right, but that's because it's just, it's, it's the Eighth Air Force was changing everything all the time. Right. You know, one of the little funny things is like the, the, not helmets, the, you know, the, the headgear that they would wear, it changed constantly, right? And so did the oxygen, the way that they got oxygen. We do some of those changes, you know, like, yeah, it's a different, you'll see it's a different oxygen adapter in one episode than it was in the other one, but who's going to notice that, you know? But we kind of did it. Same thing will be with costumes, you know, as the uniform changed, you'll see the uniform change, you know? Mm. No, that's so incredible. it's just it's just massive, you know. We didn't have to do anything like that on band. Yeah, their uniforms did change, but but not the technical stuff, you know, not right. the effects stuff, you know. How I'm curious because you have a very um, insider look, you, you behind the scenes look. How do you think the portrayal of war in television and movies has changed since something like Band of Brothers? Wow, I I. <sighs> I don't know how to answer that, you know. Um, the effects get better, you know, but war is war is war. And, and what a young man goes through when they go off to battle, you know, is, is a, you know, it, not every experience is the same, obviously, at all, quite the opposite. But every experience has some, some signposts that are the same, you know, often you go in excited and you know i mean so that story that that war is not what you think it's going to be is kind of a consistent one in in war stories right you know but obviously the technology changes you know 1917 with the single you know quote unquote single shot is really really cool you know and it's a different way of making a, a film about war you know um equally you know dunkirk uh not the most realistic of films in the reality sense but in the emotional sense really true you know like that's what it feels like to be in war it might not be literally what it looked like on that day you know so it's 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 all of us trying to kind of find that ineffable moment right of, yeah. of what and, combat is like and, I think and the technology changes but the stories don't Right. I guess and, is what I'm sort of saying. No, absolutely. And speaking of somebody who's served in two theaters of war, like I get it. There's a there's a fine line when you balance historical accuracy with dramatic storytelling. You know, I, I know if I'm telling a story about a mission I went on, you know, sometimes you, you've got to add a little yeah. dramatic effect, you know. Oh, you don't think you don't think the Easy <laughs> Company boys did that? <laughs> Seriously. Exactly. Like, I, I, you know, I spent a lot of time with those guys. You know, I heard the stories a lot of different times, you know, and sometimes a lot of different they ways. would change. <laughs> sometimes they would change a little bit, you know. Yeah. Um, and some, yeah. So, and sometimes I'd know that they're, the story they're telling is total bullshit, you know, <laughs> because that happened a couple times too. Yeah. You know, um, Memory's a funny thing that way, you know, the farther you get and they believed from it. it. Well, and then what happened with with uh, Easy Company was was they started to not so much Winters, but um, they started to just remember the story, not the reality. Right. Like they had told the story of such and such happening yeah. so many times, they could only tell it that way, right? If you started to ask them a little, well, what about when this happened? What did you feel in between these two things? They 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 won't have an answer. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm guilty. 
guilty. You know? Yeah, yeah, and that's okay. I, I'm not. That's not a judgment at all. Right? You know, I, I, I have live some in those stories memories. too about like things that went wrong, and uh, right. You know, you tell it and so many times. You don't necessarily times. want to tell those stories over and over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you, you tell it so many times, you be, almost become disconnected from it. It's like retelling mm -hmm. a movie you saw, right? Exactly. You're gonna hit that's the high totally notes, what it and, is. and I, you know, I did episode two of Band, which is Bray Corr Manor. And basically, it was like Rashomon, which is, you know, here I, I interviewed everybody who was alive, which would have been Malarkey, Lipton, Compton, obviously Winters, I don't know, whoever else. And they all had different versions. You know, that, that it was not one narrative that was exactly one perfect narrative. Everybody had little different memories, a little bit of that. And it was a puzzle for me to go, oh, okay, well, Lipton said this happened. At the same time that happened, but that's not possible because Winters was doing, you know, and I had to put it all together, you yeah. know? Yeah, and often one person's interpretation of the same event, just someone who's, you know, 20 yards that way, their interpretation exactly. of what's happening, completely different, you know? And both are correct, right? And both are I correct, mean, yep. Yeah. Dude, that, oh man, that's so good. You, you yeah. got it, you know, you know, you get it. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I, I am a, a little bit of an expert in a very small, narrow field, sure. <laughs> World War II combat. Sure. <laughs> I've uh, talked to a lot of guys, you know? Yeah, that, and, that, and that's all it's about. It, can you hint maybe at any Easter eggs? I know, you know, writers and they like to hide little things here and there. Anything that, uh, that you snuck no, in there? Not, not really. Um, uh, well, a little, you know, so there's in episode five, yeah, they, they see an Abbott and Costello movie. Um, uh, I'm related to Bud Abbott in a very weird, convoluted Hollywood LA way. Oh. So that was sort of my nod to my Abbott family. Um, <laughs> but nothing to band really. Um, you know, this was such its own thing and, and and there wasn't a lot of room for personal stuff. This was about, about you know, these four guys, you know. Yeah, I think Egan a lot of times, Levin. I'm so sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was say a lot of times people say, oh, you know, maybe there'll be a reference to one of the characters and, and a, a long lost letter, you know, some, you yeah, know, people we're, like we're that. We're not into universe, <laughs> you know, it's a real <laughs> universe. So, yes. It's not like, it's not like the MCU universe. Right. You know? <laughs> exactly, and, exactly. Um, we we take that really seriously you sure. know in these shows at least you know like like uh, you know sure. these three series are something different than a tv show they just are mm -hmm. so you know with a series like this um and, and a lot of series there's not necessarily um like here's the point here's specifically you know good guy bad guy but there's some type of general what we hope the viewers take away, a feeling, a sense. What is it from your perspective? What are you hoping uh, translates and that and that the everyday person takes away from the series? Well, I think I think first how really fucking horrible it was up there. I don't think, quite frankly, the technology existed for a film to be made that accurately portrayed the combat that that daylight bombers went through uh i love 12 o'clock high i love memphis bell but neither one really shows um an accurate representation of of aerial combat um so that was the first thing because it's it's really never been seen and, and i know people are having very strong reactions to that fact like they can't believe how awful it was, you know, and how, how, how hard the losses were. But that's obviously like a, a visceral thing. You know, I, I think, I think for me as, um, as working on the, on the film progressed, um, you know, these are always about honoring the, the real men and, and remembering what they went through. But I think in particular, this shows a different thing about industrialization and 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 a, and a, and a, the the necessity for you know gross industrialization to get the job done and our whole society was involved in it and and I think it's it's a reminder you know when I look at at what's happening in in Europe right now and and I see authoritarianism on the march 
you know, I, I think it's a, it's a reminder, you know, I, I, I never love the phrase freedom is not free. It's, it's a little trite, you know, particularly if you, you know, anybody who served, I think it's a little like, but you know what? It's also true yeah. at the same time, you know, it, 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 we, we, this life we're leading is because an awful lot of people, mostly men, but now men and women have really sacrificed a ton, including their lives. And in particular, in this air war, 84% casualty rate for our first group that went over there. Um, I just think we have to remember that, that authoritarianism is bad and it's, it's pretty good to nip it in the bud before you have to do more. Yeah. And so I, I'm one of those people that, that looks at Eastern Europe and very concerned about, about what's going on there and in, in other countries where, where authoritarianism and fascism is on, on the rise. Mm. I, well, I appreciate that. That's, that's great. Um, I know we're running short on time. So uh, last one for you. Uh, let's, let's end with something a little bit fun, a little funny. Sure. If yeah. You... A, little, a little less dark. <laughs> a little lighter note. If you yeah. were a fighter pilot uh, at this time, what, what's, uh, what's your call sign? A fighter pilot. Oh, God. Wow. Oh, I would never be a fighter pilot. I do not have balls big enough for that sort of. So I would have been a, I would have definitely been a bomber pilot, which okay. they don't really have call signs or probably a navigator. I think I relate with Crosby a little more than the other guys. What would my call sign be? Or maybe uh, a nickname. What's know. the nickname that uh, the guys yeah, call I you? No, I don't know. <laughs> no, Dr. Orloff. People, because of my weird last name, Dr. Orloff, I'm called a lot, but I don't know. What's your, What would your call name be? Uh, I, I was always CQ. I was always CQ in, uh, in the military. So <clears throat> I'm sure that would, it, it stuck with me and it's still today. So 20, 20 plus I don't know, years. Maybe bifocals. I don't know. Old man. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't I like know. It. I have to think about that. You gotta, yeah. You got to think about that. Uh, so uh, and what's, uh, what's next for you? Uh, are you, are we hoping for a season two? Are we hope are, are I, there more projects? I doubt. I, well, I think we're all taking, well, actually I should say we're all, I'm taking a little bit of a break. Um, but I think we're all, to, this was really a very difficult project to make, you know, and I think we're all just kind of taking a, a breath, you know, it was just so, we made it also during COVID, you know, it was a really intense shoot and, and I think we're all just kind of, okay, let's just take a breath here, see what happens, you know. Um, but and and there can't be a second season anyway because it, you know, different. They they go home where the ones yeah. that survive, you know. New story to tell, yeah. New okay. new story to tell. There's yeah. always a new story to tell. Anthology um, series, you know, a new cast yeah, every every yeah, season. Yeah, we'll see. Thing. We'll we see. That's not in, <laughs> it's not impossible. It's not impossible. You have no idea. We're, but hopefully, it wouldn't take ten years to make. <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't know if I have. I don't know if I have that in me, you know. <laughs> I was going to say, we're being greedy. We want more. It's so, it's yeah, so yeah, good. Yeah. We want more. Um, so, all right, everybody, that will do it. I want to thank my incredible guest, Mr. John Orloff. Uh, make sure you guys tune in to Masters of the Air, available only on Apple TV, which, as of this recording, the first six episodes are out. Um, they're amazing in every conceivable way. Uh, the final three episodes, I believe, are, are out, coming out in the coming Fridays. Uh, so, John, I'll give you the last few seconds here. Uh, we have majority of a military audience. Uh, is there anything you want to say to the audience before we let you go? Just remember most of it really happened. You know, we really, we really try to not make shit up. You know, we really do. Yeah. You'll catch us making up some things, but trust me, it's not about that. It's really about celebrating, you know, the greatest in America, you know? Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks. All right. Thank you. <laughs>